Let me let me start very briefly by welcoming you, welcome, welcoming you to our fall business conference. This is a program we launched a few semesters a few years ago to give to you uh, the the business student body an opportunity to hear what's going on in the business world and help you think about career options. Uh, today we are very fortunate to have an individual who will speak to us uh, who's just joined us and who will speak to us about his experience in general and particularly with uh, the, uh, the 96 Olympics. Uh, we have been growing an area uh, in the School of Business in supply chain management. It's a very important area to our state. It's a very important area for people who want careers. I'm not talking about people driving forklift trucks. I'm talking about people who are dealing with all facets of business and get just-in-time inventory. It, it's critical. It's, it's uh, a big area. It offers great careers and, and well-paying jobs. Um, we, start, we, we did this very knowingly after spending time interviewing the community, say, what do you need? We had the opportunity to have Clayton State's first and only eminent scholar position, and we wanted to fill that in something that really made sense for you, our students. And after talking with the, the surrounding business community for over a year, Dr. Chaco and I came to the strong conclusion that we had to find something in logistics supply chain management because of the growing importance of this area. And we were very, very fortunate after a long search to get the current holder of that chair, Dr. Uh, George Messer, to join our team. He's done a great job. So I'm now going to turn it over to, to George to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Dean Miller. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am George Messer. I've, uh, I've been here at Clayton State since uh, 2001. And, and as Bud said, there's a, uh, there was a recognized need prior to 2001 for professionally trained, educated people in the area of logistics and supply chain management. Now, why is that? What, what kind of business do you see on the south side of Atlanta? Some manufacturing, <coughs> distribution, transportation, warehousing. Uh, you see a lot of international freight forwarders, air cargo operations, import, export, customs house brokerage type firms. Uh, just before I came over, I, I took a, a glance at the Atlanta Air Cargo Association website. <clears throat> Today there are 16 new jobs posted on their website for knowledge area workers in logistics and supply chain management. This year they've had over 600 postings already. A couple of years ago, there was a study that was commissioned by the Board of Regents for the University System of Georgia. The study was actually accomplished by Georgia Tech. They said that each year, the, the state of Georgia, <coughs> excuse me, is adding over 2,000 job, new jobs each year in core logistics functions. In addition to that, there's only 12,000, over 12,000 peripheral jobs. To, to those core jobs. So it's, it's a huge growth area. Uh, as, as Bud has, has as Dr. Dean Miller has told you, uh, at Clayton State, we have an opportunity for students as undergraduates. If you're majoring in management, marketing, general business, or even accounting, you can also complete a concentration or a specialization in logistics supply chain management. We now have an MBA program whose focal area is logistics and supply chain management. Uh, this past year, we received a grant from the state of Georgia called the Intellectual Capital Partnership Program, ICAP. And, and the primary focus of the ICAP grant was to enhance and improve our logistics supply chain management offerings for, for you. So it, it's a huge growth area. It's recognized by the state. And, and through our ICAP grant, we were fortunate enough to be able to hire John Mescatola to join our faculty. 
excuse me, John has a distinguished career in the logistics industry. He was, he's been a past president of the uh, Atlanta Council for Logistics Management, which is the largest chapter in the United States, the largest chapter internationally for the Council of Logistics Management. He's a was international logistics director for NCR Corporation. He's had just a distinguished career in the logistics industry, and uh, his reputation was uh, so outstanding that when the Atlanta organizing group for the Olympics uh, was awarded the Olympics here, they hired him to head the logistics function. So, We've asked John today to tell you about that specific part of, of his background and experience, and, and we're just very happy to have him as a uh, member of our faculty. Uh, we're, we're very pleased that we're able to offer now an MBA program and an undergraduate program for, to give you opportunities for jobs, positions in this area. So, John, that's <coughs> Yeah, thank you. Hope everybody can hear me well enough. I uh, had the good fortune to catch a brief cold yesterday, and so it's kind of affecting me a little bit here, so I hope I'm projecting okay. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I've heard so much about this forum, and when I was asked to share uh, the experiences I had with the Olympic Committee, I said, sure, why not? Love to do it. So we'll f we're going to... Buckle down for the next three hours. Uh, we have a very good presentation to go. And I was told that I have 45 minutes to get a three hour presentation down into a capsulized version. So I'm gonna do my best to get whatever interest there is to you and how we solved a lot of the problems that were confronted with us through logistics in, in the venues and for the Olympic Games. So who was literally responsible for the Olympic Games? How many of you went to the actual games? I mean, you were young enough to be there. Hopefully they were in Atlanta um, that you went. Uh, what I'm gonna talk about is some of the venues uh, behind the scenes in Atlanta, definitely behind the scenes in Savannah. My responsibility when I came on board was to be the person to put the infrastructure together for Atlanta, which was the jewel, which was the hub for all the Olympics, as well as all the venues around the area in the various states, and as well as Savannah, Savannah being the yawning venue. So that was my task, as well as anything else that came my way was thrown to me to be a problem solver. The Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games, otherwise known as ACOG, was the company, the corporation in this case, that was holding and responsible for putting the games on in Atlanta. Many, many times I was asked, what is ACOG and how has ACOG come about? So what I did is I put it into a business frame of mind. Basically, ACOG was a $2 billion corporation. It was, sole responsibility was to produce one product that had a shelf life for 17 days. And then it went out of business. Now the product was the games. The 17 days was the duration of the games. And then after the games is over, ACOG disbanded and we had the hugest garage sale you ever wanted to see. But it was the best opportunity that anybody can have, especially from a logistician's point of view. When ACOG got the, when, when Atlanta got awarded the games, I remember exactly where I was. I had dropped off my youngest son to daycare, sat there, listened to the radio announcement that Atlanta got it, and I vowed that as a logistician I could not just let the games go by and not be part of it. So that was my drive, that was my goal, and they ended up being successful enough to get the position. Little did I know what I was gonna get, it just happened to be a very good opportunity to have an impact. Through logistics, what is logistics? Logistics is the activities associated with the movement and storage of a product. That's basically it, it's all the muscle, it's the movement, it's the touching part of the supply chain. So what was the role of logistics in ACOG? Okay, basically we were responsible for warehousing, distributing, recovering all the assets uh, uh, for the games. We were responsible for importing and exporting the product of uh, the assets back for the teams as well as for the sponsors. 
We provided logistic support for all the venues. We were transportation for all the assets. We were the, the muscle of the games, and we were the backstop, which meant that there was nobody behind logistics. There was nobody to pass the ball to. We were the last in the pecking order, and we were the most important, of course, but nobody understood what we really did. So that was a big exercise that I was bringing in from the industry to the event management is what is logistics? I mean, it was a constant question everybody asked all, day, all the time. But we were the last department. We could never say no. We were it, and it had to happen. Now, the way I designed the presentation was to give you actual events that happened to me, how they were presented to me, the problems <coughs> that were caused by the situation, and how we solved them. So basically, you're going to see some of the conversations that I had. On the first day of my job, after my first cup of coffee, I was told that we had to get an infrastructure together for Atlanta. Didn't know what was required, had no clue what was needed. I was never in the event management profession before. There was no history because none of the games from previous games was required to report on logistics. It was only required to report on finance and attendance, and that was it. So there was no history to go by. So we had to really, really sit down and we had to figure it out what it was we needed, how big was this warehouse infrastructure to be. And myself and another fellow who were from the industry, we sat down with a blank piece of paper and we came up with tons of questions and where we're we going to get the information from. So the first thing we had to do, of course, was survey our users. And the users in this case, the biggest one was sports management. They were the ones that were responsible for the liaison between the, the athlete and the requirements for the athlete, such as the, uh, the equipment that was used and, and uh, the stuff that was used during the games. So basically, the main survey, of course, was to get a picture of this warehouse, what it is we needed to do, what was it we needed to warehouse. So of course, the major question was, is everything rackable? Now, for those who do not understand what racking is, if you go to a Home Depot or a Lowe's, their entire product sits on these metal frames that are called racking and they create little little cubby holes that you put the product in. So that was the ideal situation was to get product that you can put away in the racks so you can have workable space for the venue, for the warehouse. Now in this particular case the answer that I asked and the answer to the question I asked and the answer that I got was yes everything in my venue is rackable. Well what happens is as stuff starts coming in they were not rackable. And I'm going to lower this light a little bit is that too much for the camera? So what happens here is everything was coming in odd shapes. There was just no way we were able to get anything that was rackable. What you're seeing here is the basketball nets for the, for the venue. And when we spoke to the manufacturer of these nets, I asked them, said, can they be, can they be stored in an upright position? Because I figured I can lay 15 of these along one of the walls in the warehouse. And he goes, yes, but. Well, yes, but meant no. <laughs> so the point is, is that they could not stand in an upright position because they could, the hydraulics couldn't sustain its weight for the long span of time. The warehouse was in operations a year and a half before the games. We had to have the infrastructure in place before anything even showed up. So what you're seeing here, we were already in operations a good eight months before anything even showed up to the door. So what we had on paper, was not materializing as things started showing up. Here you have 10,000 plus uh, floor fans that went into all the athletes' dorms. And they went everywhere else, so we had to store fans. Again, a non-rackable commodity. Here you have wooden barricades that were used for crowd control. So anything and everything that was used in the games came to the infrastructure. We had folding chairs, over, uh, over 17,000 folding tables and 83,000 folding chairs. And trust me, those tables were very heavy. They were heavier than this. They were, they were gray for mica, and they came in lengths of 6, 8, and 10 feet. And they were very, very heavy. Here we broke down the chairs to be in increments of 100. So we had units of 100 going out to the venue. So it kept inventory a little bit easier to handle. And plus, while we had the time, we were able to create the picking units. Now, a lot of the units we used had the logo of the games on it, which was the flowery torch. Well, before we erected caging in the warehouse, we didn't realize that everybody wanted to have a piece of the action 
which meant that anything that had a look at the games on it disappeared. We were responsible for a lot of this from our security standpoint because ACOG bought the apparatuses used for the games. So if we buy it, we can't lose it because we had to go back and buy it again. And really, this stuff was one-time one production. Now, in here was the cage that we put all the small stuff in here. And in the back, it's actually a hard picture to see, but back over here, we had the javelins and we have shock puts and, and discs, discuses. That's a hard word. Is it disc guy or discuses? Whatever. <laughs> what we found out was that every one of those sports apparatus was had an, a serial number on it. And this was a learning curve to us because we had to record the serial number of every one of those units coming in because if a record was set in Javelin, for example, we had to record the serial number was given to Country X. And if that was the record setter, we had to take it off the field, record it, verify it, that it was the right piece of equipment that we, ACOG, issued to that particular athlete. We didn't understand that. We didn't know that. It was a problem we had to solve as soon as the product started coming into the warehouse. Now we're into lot control management, and it was not in our planning. And we actually decided uh, how to go about doing it, and we had to. So prior to that, we were deciding that ACOG was publishing itself as being the high-tech Olympics ever. Everything was going to be technically driven. Warehouse management was going to be by J.D. Edwards' warehouse put-away, automatic put-away. Uh, bells and whistles you can touch. Everything was going to be barcoded, RF scanned. As soon as it came in, as soon as it went out, we were going to scan it. But nobody figured that barcodes don't, did not stick to metal. Barcodes did not stick to wood. Barcodes didn't stick to a lot of things. So what we had to do is we had to do a lot of manual workarounds, and we really couldn't barcode as much of the stuff as we had planned. And I'll explain a little bit more on that as we go on. But Panasonic supplied TVs, and a lot of these TVs were used in non-competitive venues. They were used for the media. They were used for press. So we had a lot of TVs running around. Now what we actually planned for is, in this particular case, gut reaction or gut feel was really the driving force and what we really needed. We decided we needed a million square foot of warehouse space. Trying to find a million square feet in Atlanta was very tough. We were very lucky to find an old dilapidated Sears warehouse that was down on Jefferson Street, which is down by the state prison or the county prison. And it was the worst thing you ever wanted to walk into. It was the kind where you held your breath as you walked into the building because it was old, asbestos ridden, dirty, run down, and was vacant for five years. So you can take that as a mental picture, but it was ideal for what we needed to do. We needed a million square feet. This building was ideal. Part of my responsibility of getting the infrastructure established was hiring the staff. So I hired my manager for the warehouse. The first thing we did was we walked through. The first sign we ever put up was, don't drink the water. Because we did not know where the water was coming from. So we had to go out and get bottled water and so forth. And for the two years, we made sure nobody drank the water coming out of the taps. But as it turned out, with everything and all the surprises that came in, we actually only used less than 50,000 square feet of racking space. We were right on the, the numbers for, uh, for uh, shelving. And of course, we used 735,000 uh, square feet of space for bulk storage. Now, some fun facts. We distributed six, over 60,000 reams of paper. That's 30 million sheets of paper. And we, uh, the big thing we said, that's a lot of sheets, OK? Xerox was one of the sponsors who had, in order to get the five rings, the mark was $50 million in order to have the rights to publish and say you're an official sponsor. Of that number, some of it was cash and a lot of it was value in kind. In this case here, Xerox value in kind was giving us the paper. We said, again, we were going to be high tech, everything was going to be computer driven, we were going to do everything through PCs. We didn't realize that we were wasting more paper through the PC process than we would if we were doing it manually. Because every time we ran a spreadsheet, somebody would print it. Ah, we didn't like that. Get the margins down. You run it again. And they print it 30 pages, 20 pages, 10 pages. We started consuming so much paper that we, we depleted Atlanta's inventory of white paper from Xerox that they started giving us pastel colors. Because nobody was buying pastel colors, so they gave us pastel colors. 
and all the different floors we had in, in the office in Atlanta, which was, the, uh, which was right next to the Inforum, was you can tell each, each floor had a different color paper. So if you were on the third floor, you had pink. If you were on the fourth floor, you had green, yellow, and white. So no, very few had white. But when somebody came to a meeting and they had a rainbow set of colors, you knew that they were just going floor to floor to buy paper, to find paper for printing. But we had a staff of 3,200 people to clean the venues. Panasonic gave us 12,000 TVs. 85% of the, of the sports equipment was imported. This was a pure sign of globalization. We thought that we were going to have the opposite. We figured a lot of stuff was going to be domestically supplied, but to our supply, surprise, 85% of the sports equipment came from overseas. And it was kind of sad, but it was the awakening for us that globalization definitely was there. The interesting thing here, the next one was, even though we had computers and printers, there was still a high demand for typewriters. And this, this came from a lot of the um, sports writers wanted typewriters. So we had to go out and we had to find the necessary typewriters. Another problem came to me was Motorola, corporate sponsor. They were supplying us with all the handheld uh, cell phones and, and radios. And as you can see, we had 8,000, 2,000 cell phones, 10,000 pagers and radios. We had a warehouse and we couldn't lose them. The value and kind part of it was we're going to give you this to use. If you lose it, it's not replaced at market value. It's replaced at what we think it should be replaced at. So what happened is it becomes a negotiation. So a handheld or a cell phone radio at that, uh, a cell phone at that time may have been, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars. They want a couple thousand. So they wanted to make sure we had a pinch point that we weren't just going to arbitrarily lose it. So of course, the problem we had is we had to store it and we couldn't lose it. So the Sears building was great with nooks and crannies. This was one of the mezzanines. We took it down and we held it for the Motorola. Definitely we barcoded these products as we had to make sure asset management was taken care of. Interesting thing about here Motorola, today you've got your cell phones and I don't know what brand it is, Verizon or T-Mobile, where you're actually doing it like uh, a handheld radio, handheld two-way radio. We were doing that during the games. I was in Savannah during the games, and I was on a handheld radio communicating with the people in Atlanta. So we were actually the test market of what the technology is out there today that you're using with your cell phones. To our dismay, only two were lost in the Savannah River, which is pretty good. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, it was down in Savannah, you know, but I wasn't responsible for that. I want to point the finger to sports management. Basically, in Savannah, with the air, the salt air and everything, they had to put the radios inside a plastic bag around their necks. The two people were hauling in the markers for the course, and as they leaned over, the, the radio came out. My response was, why didn't you dive in after it? <laughs> because it was a couple thousand dollars that was coming out of our fixed budget, in which we didn't have money, okay? So they looked at me kind of funny, and you know, they didn't improve my humor at the time. Okay, so now we had another problem that came my way. The processes in Atlanta weren't working. We had set up the warehouse to be a traditional warehouse. Every time the door opened up with a truck delivery, it just messed everything up. So what do we do? We needed speed. We had to get things in and out into the venues very quickly. So John, what do we need to do? Well, basically we had to reevaluate the processes and we had to redesign it over and over and over again. Basically what this means is you're coming home every Monday your wife, your husband, your, your partner says, we're going to rearrange the house. I want to make it look like this this week, next Monday. We're going to rearrange the house. We're going to make it look like this week. And that's what we were going through. Remember, this is an 800,000 square foot warehouse. Trying to change this warehouse on the fly was very hard to do because we were changing it as product was coming in the door. We had to service 28 competition venues, 29. Uh, uh, training venues in 86 non-competitive. For every competition there was a training venue so the athletes got familiar with that venue so when they went to the actual competition it wasn't new to them. They were very comfortable with the layout and, and, and the processes that were around it. But what we ended up doing was looking at all the venues and saying why don't we just cut up the warehouse to fit the required needs of each venue. And so what we actually ended up doing was, was actually very, very efficient. We received in the warehouse, put it straight to the venue. Instead of receiving it, putting it away, 
picking orders and delivering it to a, a remote venue, we actually kept the process within the building. So we received it from the dock, put it into the venue. We literally received it considerably at the venue. The venue man the logistics manager had inventory right in front of him. It was able to see what they had, make sure everything was there, and then we shipped it complete to the venue at time of setup. So what did we do technically wise? We took everything on the high end and told the computer electronically, we received it, we put it away, we shipped it, and we received it at the venue, never leaving the building. Down in the lower levels, we were constantly doing paper transactions, PC-driven transactions. We were doing tens of thousands of transactions, but only feeding up the major bulk for the financial accountability. So basically, we, by the size of the venue, got the largest footprint. This is the track and field venue. Here you got the preliminary basis for the pole vaulting where they actually come in and they put the pole down. This is the part that they drive the pole into before they go over. But they had a lot of trolleys and they're here to move over. You had um, the hurdles are here. This is part of the pole vaulting setup. So you can see even, even in a knockdown state, stuff was going into the venue, making sure we had everything received in time. Because what we couldn't afford to do is receive to the venue and have them short. We needed to understand what was coming because 85% of it was overseas. So if something came in and it was missing, we had the time to go and find it and go get it. We didn't want to be surprised at the time we had to deploy it to the venue and set it up that we were missing something. This here is the horse park. This here is the horse park. You have 2,000 disposable jumpsuits and boots. Now, there's an interesting story here with the, with the, uh, with the equestrian. Did anybody go to it in Conyers? It was in Conyers. It was pretty nice, wasn't it? What we found out is, is logistics had to go to every meeting that a venue had, and we had to really take down good notes because we were the backstop, as I said. In other terms, it's dumping ground of different tasks and stuff. So we're sitting there, and we're taking notes, and the people are saying, the athletes are going to be coming in by airplane in the Atlanta airport, and logistics needs to meet them and pick them up. Okay, no problem. Note taken. You know, the athletes are going to be held at the airport for three days. We're going to put them in quarantine. And after they're out of quarantine, logistics has to move them to the, to the venue. I'm saying, okay, this doesn't make any sense. Why do we have to hold athletes? Why do we have to hold athletes at the airport for three days? So I raised my hand. I said, who are we talking about here? And they said, the athlete's the horse. So everything that was associated with the venue was the horse. Well, okay, now it makes sense why the horse had to be quarantined for three days and not the actual athlete. So the, the, the rider is not the athlete. Although the rider gets all the credit, it's the horse in, in Olympics terminology is the athlete. So I write a little note to the guy next to me. So I said, well, does that mean the car is the athlete in NASCAR and not the driver? <laughs> but anyhow, disposable, we were responsible for cleaning out the horse stall every night. And I'm saying, where is this a logistics problem, you know? <laughs> and they said, oh, we got all volunteers. Volunteers don't want to clean it out. Yeah, but what makes logistics be the one that wants to clean it out? But again, we were the backstop. This was the result of a backstop. We couldn't say no. It was part of our responsibility. This here is just the venue. This is the uh, field hockey venue. And you can see all the tables and chairs that were needed there. Exercise for training. This one here. Again, we, we had to consume a lot of space on the floor. This is the wrestling mat. As Soon as it comes in from overseas, we have to put it together for two reasons. One, we need to know how to put it together. And two, we need to make sure everything is there. But you can see how much space this thing is taken up and how much we had to consume in unused warehousing space. 15,000 beds. We took over Georgia Tech. We took over every dormitory sorority at Georgia Tech. Of course, we built the athlete dorms as well, but it still wasn't enough beds. We had to warehouse all the beds here. There was three fellows that were given the assignments to do the bed storage. I told them, I said, don't stack them too high. Plastic on plastic doesn't really travel too well. And I said, you should band them together. Well, did they pay attention? No. <laughs> what was their assignment for the whole duration of the games? Bed deployment because they created a problem that we did not want to pass along to anybody else. So anytime there was a call for beds, the three fellows we called the bed kings got the call to fill the orders. So they had to live with their problem. At games times, logistics had 1,200 full-time staff members. And the reason for that was 
we needed to have people there at the time the games were deployed out and we needed to have people after the game so the only way we can do that was to hire full-time people and not have volunteers our budget was 25 million dollars we distributed 8 million pounds of ice and we stopped counting rolls of toilet paper after we hit a, a million plus and that definitely was a lot of sheets there's no doubt about it <laughs> that was a lot of deployment we were hiring so many staff people every Monday we come to work there was a new a new group of people sitting in there so what we did very basic and very simple and very very accurate is we posted everybody's picture so this this was not the true workers but these were the management level people who we had to interface with and these are all logistics venue managers and of course it was the only way we can keep track so if we pass somebody in the hallway we're saying who's that we immediately go to the board and we try to find them we find out what venue they're in so very primitive but yet very effective at the same time now logistics uh, ACOG was pushing uh, recyclables that was one of the selling tools we had with the International Olympic Committee so some statistics here we had 18 million pounds of trash that required 1.2 million trash bags and 15,000 trash cans which was pretty obvious but the, the important part here the statistic is that the recyclables that we went through 20 million and got 20 million plastic bottles and two pounds of paper so we were very recyclable and that was a very big selling tool that, uh, that was done after that. The next two points are real interesting. The water polo came from Italy. The water polo pool came from Italy. The only thing domestic on the water polo was the hole in the ground. <laughs> we brought in brick by brick, tile by tile, and we created the polo pool. Just like you hear about olden days where people would buy a castle and move it over brick by brick. Well, that's what we did here. And it was mind-boggling to us because, A, we had to import it, B, we had to put it together, and C, we had to export it back out, which meant we had to dismantle it. Very interesting statistic, very interesting exercise. Now, the equestrians here, this was another interesting thing for logistics. The equestrians were made in Germany, painted, imported in Savannah, painted in a little town outside of Savannah, and transported to Conyers. We were responsible for that entire process transporting them in the up set up position now the equestrians if you ever watch it on tv they have some pretty neat looking you know jumps okay so they're not just pieces of wood they're figures they're shapes they're everything we had to move them in an upright position on a flatbed on route 16 and that was very interesting because we couldn't break them we couldn't damage them they were done in germany once they came over we couldn't get another one done already so it was very, very tight control and very big burden, risk and burden put on us to do it, but we were successful in doing it. Now, the Savannah venue was the hardest venue outside of the Olympics, outside of the Atlanta warehouse infrastructure. So I had already passed that on. I had done all the remotes at this particular time, identified what was required. Savannah really was my, my hardest one to solve, and it was really mine on day two of my employment. After my second cup of coffee, I was given Savannah. Again, part of the program, part of the sponsorships, Brunswick was the owners of the boats. They gave us $8.5 million worth of inventory that we were trusted to. So the breakdown was in 95, we started getting the boats and we were responsible for it. And we had to give it back to them in a pristine state two years later. How many people here own boats? Okay. The statement that the story is there's two happy days of a boat owner's life. The day they buy it, and the day they sell it, okay? And those who own it during the rest of their life says, all a boat is is a hole in the water they dump money into. I live it and I can attest to it. But to put a boat in the water, especially the Savannah River and all that stuff, is very messy and very dirty. So to us to put it back and get it back two years later was a major task. Warehousing boats, just need to understand, I never did it myself, it was a learning curve all the days. It was mobile, it was big, and we needed space. That was really my criteria. Down in Savannah, there are no warehouses outside of any size. But I was lucky enough to go to the Port Authority in, in Savannah and ended up getting our warehouse, which was perfect. This is inside the Port Authority. It gave me security, and it also gave me workable space. This was an ideal warehouse. This was perfect for mobility. All right. Typical hallway conversation. 
John Brunswick sending the boats to you. You should get them next week. As a cost savings initiative, I'm buying one trailer for three boats. Have a nice weekend. <laughs> this in business is what's called passing the monkey. Okay, as that person, as the door was closing on the elevator with a Cheshire cat smile on his face, he threw that monkey on me. He had a great weekend. Mine wasn't that good. Because my plan was one-to-one -one ratio. I needed to be quick, I needed to be mobile, I needed to react very fast, and a one-to-one -one ratio was my solution. The boats start coming in, I had no choice. I wasn't getting enough trailers at the time, we had to put these on blocks. This was very, very detrimental to our deployment plan because we couldn't react fast enough. Here you have a truck and a boat. I needed triple space. I needed the length of the boat, the length of the trailer, and the length of the truck just to either get that boat blocked or to get the boat on, the, on, on the, the trailer to deploy. I didn't have the time for that, nor did I have the space. I needed triple the size warehouse that I had, and there was just no way I was going to be in multiple warehouses. So anything that was larger than 20 feet, I had it deployed to the marina that I had contracted to do our services with. So you can see, these are 40-foot boats. They're even on blocks. This was a major, major, major problem. Then I had to go out and find talented people who were really marinas, mariners, to, to, to do this talent. I didn't have it, nor did our staff have it. But we had to live with it. Well, I get this another meeting that I had from the Georgia, director of Georgia Port Authority. He says, hey, by the way, now that you're in your warehouse, I need to get to my warehouse, and I need to have the abilities to deliver my product via railroad and we have to come straight through your warehouse and I'm saying what are you talking about I mean here I had this pristine warehouse and here was his warehouse and he had to go through mine I didn't even know that there was a rail spur in my warehouse <laughs> until he went out there with a little broom and kind of brushed off the tracks that were hidden under the dirt and said oh by the way here it is you know so there it was sure enough so we had to rip that warehouse apart we had to break up and I had a violation of security. Of course, security was a big thing. We didn't want anybody to know where we were, and there was a reason for that. So what happens here is that I was going to go all the way up to the top with fencing, but I stopped at 12 feet. It was too expensive. But in addition to the four feet that was down on the bottom, you know, an engine coming through is really this high. It's enormous if anybody ever saw a diesel engine up close. And I don't know what it is, but engineers have this knack of wanting to blow that whistle at the weirdest of times. <laughs> And I have no idea why, if there's a script that says you got to yank it nine times at two minutes each yank, I don't know. But every time he came inside this warehouse, he'd blow that whistle. And boy, that thing would echo out. Of the way. And, I got, and he was a great guy. And I said, what are you doing this for? There's nobody here. Oh, I just want to hear the echo. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, well, don't do it while we're here, OK, because it's too loud. Every month, we had to do a venue report. So I'm doing a report up to, up to senior management. And they're saying, as it says, my ability to service the venue will take me longer than originally planned because of the decision to, take one, to have one boat trail for every three boats. I have to place every Brunswick boat I get on blocks. I have to hire experienced boat movers to do this task. And it's a high risk and it costs a lot of money. It takes us close to two hours to block the small boats and over four hours to block the larger boats. Well, hey, that's good statistics, right? I think that was a good point. Man, I had more glassy eyes looking at me from senior management like, oh, so what's the deal? You know, we're saving money, you know, so what's the deal? So I'm reading, this is all within seconds, right? And I'm saying, I'm not making this point. I'm not winning this war. I'm not winning this battle. So as I'm cleaning up and as they're waiting for the next person to come on, I pretty much said, oh, by the way, I got a train that's running through my warehouse every night. And it vibrates the floors and it shakes the boats. Well, you should have seen a little perking up in that meeting. And I was like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Blah, blah, blah. You know, so I went in and I told them. A week later, I had one trailer for every boat. When they realized that there was $8 million in jeopardy, when they realized the risk that we had, when they realized that that boat can vibrate and fall over and have a domino effect in that warehouse, just by that one train coming through, the heck with the cost savings initiative, because it wasn't going to save enough money to, retro, to, to pay back any damage that was going on to, to the boats or to people. So it won that battle. And you can see we needed to have it. There's no doubt about it, stuff coming in. This is what the boat looked like fully ready to deploy. We moved 
all those boats over 9,000 times. Never would have been able to do it if I had a one to three ratio. This was the machine that did it. It was a tractor. We retrofitted it back here with three size balls, depending on the size of the, of the trailer to move the, the, the boats. And they were ideal pulling power. Turning radius was phenomenal. This was great for an outside venue. There's no way we would have done it with trucks. You know, trucks were good getting it through the roads to the venue, but once it was on the venue property, the tractor was the best thing to do. And I used that within the warehouse as well. What is a logistic department without a big truck, right? You got to have a truck. We took the people mover or the athletic movers, talked to the manufacturer and says, can we modify this thing to be a flatbed truck? We needed to deploy to a floating marina that was six miles out to sea. We not only had to service the marina on land, but we had to service the athlete on a remote location. And I needed a boat. I needed a truck that can make it happen. And this was it. This was a delivery that we were making out to the venue. And um, this, by the way, is Captain Pete. He's a great guy. He was a salvage, salvage diver. I think he came up a couple times too fast. <laughs> because next to the, the train engineer, Pete was number two on the list of kind of strange attitudes, but he was a great guy, great kid. This was the floating marina that we had a logistics network right here, and I had a crew that had to service all the athletic, and these are all the countries that were competing, and we had, a, we had to service them, and it was a carpet. It was a nice little operation there, but it was very hard to, to service. This was just how logistics was, was launching the boats, and this is what the floating marina looked like when it was battened down at the end of the day. Now, this was my break. Oh, position. <laughs> I can't do that anymore, I'm sorry. This was the culmination of two years worth of pedal to the metal planning. It was around the clock, there was no break. We were already set. It took us two weeks to get the venue in Savannah already set up. We had a break. We had an opportunity to just relax, to mentally crash and go party. So I'm in, I'm in this, this, this high, I'm in this high level of attitude here and all of a sudden I get John Alanis on the phone. I get to the phone, they said, are you next to a fax machine? Yes, I am. He says, we're sending you over a fax we need to discuss. What comes over is a hurricane. Second hurricane of the season, Hurricane Bertha. And if you can see, this is Florida, so it was heading right towards Savannah. My boss has said to me, he says, John, next to, next to the venue manager, Rich, you and he are the only two people who know that if this hurricane hits Savannah, the venue is not built to sustain the winds that are being projected of 120 miles an hour. We're moving the venue to Miami if the hurricane should hit. Can you get everything down to Miami in a day? Yeah, sure, no problem. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, sure, no problem. Hang up the phone. I'm saying, oh, man. How am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to get 180 boats? First of all, I had to deploy everything back. So I had to get my crew together. I had less than six hours to do it because of the daylight. It was a daylight venue. I had to get my entire crew back after we took two weeks to set up this venue to go back and say, we've got to pull everything back. We had to take all 180 boats out of the water. We had to ground them. We had to take all the competition boats off the floating marina back into a school that I had taken down as my warehouse put everything that in there, batten down the hatches, and then go home and pray that the hurricane didn't hit. We did everything as planned. I did not have a plan for Miami to get all the, comp all the support boats down, but I did have a plan to get the competitive boats down. The support boats were going to be used by people in Miami who owned boats, and we were just going to contract them to support the people out in the water. But luckily, the hurricane went to Charleston, wreaked havoc at Charleston. We had nothing but a couple of twigs that fell down. Now we come back in and what, what was the, the instructions? Put everything all back out again that you just took down. So we had to redeploy everything all out and we had one day to do it. We ended up doing it around nine o'clock that night and the following morning was the uh, opening day for the yachting event. The other problem we had was, you know, because it was so far out, even though we had massive horsepower on our boat, we couldn't get out there fast enough because the ice was melting. And even though it was melting a little bit, once you put it back in the refrigeration, those ice cubes become ice blocks. And they virtually no good to the athletes especially, and they were no good to the workers. So we had a serious problem here is that even though we had thermal boxes and we had wraps going on there, it just wasn't doing enough because it was taking too long for us to get out to the venue. 
So again, we're sitting there trying to figure it out, realizing where we were. We were at a marina. This was the marina that, that had all those big boats out earlier, but here was the logistics dock and the boat would be loaded here. And this was a drop down by 10 or 20 steps going down to the boat. So we're saying, okay, we're at a marina. How are we gonna solve this problem? So we took advantage of what was there. And of course, what does a marina do but launches and takes out boats? We took the boat out of the water, brought the boat to the source, loaded the boat straight onto the source. We had everything done in 20 minutes. The boat was gone. Water was saved. Everybody was heroes. Logistics lived to, to another day. Now, some last fun facts. There was 197 countries that attended the games, the largest in, in Olympic history, perfect attendance. There was 10,600 athletes broken down accordingly. The Olympics was played in 13 states and uh, 13 cities and four states. It was the first Olympics in history that passed on to the next hosting country that spoke the same language. Boy, there was a lot of information we had shared with them, and it was great for, for, uh, for Sydney. And the Olympic Games was the first time it was, it was paid for by corporate sponsors. Not one tax dollar was used. It was the first and the last time that the International Olympic Committee was going to let that happen. Tax money is the only guarantee that an Olympics Games will take place. There was no guarantee here that the sponsors were going to live up to their money. But Billy Payne had the faith and he had the charisma to get the people to come and do it, and it worked. It was successful, but Samaraj didn't like it, and he says, never again is it going to happen. Well, that's fine for everybody else, and it was great for Atlanta. That's my story, and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> are there any questions? For those who are optimistic here, this, by the way, is the uh, pot at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> if you, if you can see that. <clears throat> so if you ever wonder, there it is. I found it. Yes, sir? John, how much time and work did you have to do with after the games? After the games in Savannah, we deployed everything back in three days because we had the exercise because of the hurricane. It actually took us... Two, uh, two months to actually finish everything and sell it and collect it. The ironic thing about it, very interesting thing, is we settled our scores, our liabilities through the bartering system. That when somebody says they owed us money, I called them into the warehouse and said, hey, let's walk the warehouse and anything besides boats or whatever, if you want, we'll pull it out and we'll agree that that's going to satisfy the bill. And that's how we paid. That's how Olymp uh, ACOG paid for their bills after the games. We had no more money. So we bartered anything that we could. It worked. The bartering system worked, and we were proven living of it. Any other questions? Hey, yes? I know you said in the beginning that, um, that a lot of the um, equipment or 85% of the equipment came from overseas. Like, overseas. Was that like you guys was doing? Like, is that where you guys sought out the um, merchandise, or was it just they were willing to do it and we weren't willing to? A couple things. Sports management was responsible for buying the equipment for the games. They were sourcing overseas because that's where all the manufacturers were. There was no manufacturers based in the United States. Everything was, and if they were, their, their headquarters was the United States, but the point of manufacture was overseas. So it just happened to be that that's where the sourcing was driving us. That's where all the companies who made the apparatuses made it. So we had no choice. And it was price because a lot of times, if they were sponsors, you had to take their product. You know, and all the weightlifting equipment's from Japan because that company happened to sponsor it. They bought the five rings, and by that time they said, okay, by the way, now you gotta pick it up from here. And so that's really where it came from. It came from donation and sourcing. Anybody else? If anyone else has questions, yeah. please come on down. Yep. I know a lot of students have to get to their <coughs> class. Come on down, John will be here for a little bit. Appreciate it, thank you very much. <laughs>